Hello world, it's Siraj, and today we're going to build a genetic algorithm for the game Space Invaders. Well, it's actually not Space Invaders, it's called Sidious Invaders, but it's, a, it's very similar. It's based off of Space Invaders. So I'm going to start off with a demo of what we're going to build. There's a JavaScript version of this and there's a Python version of this. And of course we're going to do the Python version because that's what we do, Python, of course. So let's, let's look at this game first. Ready, set, go. Okay, so we are this dude at the bottom. You, you've played Space Invaders before. I don't need to tell you how Space Invaders works, but this is a special version because what happens is these invaders will uh, breed or cross over every five seconds. They're gonna breed every five seconds. And my job, I'll hit the space bar, is to kill them all, all the time. All of them. They're gonna keep on breeding over and over again. And I've gotta get them to be obliterated, but they're just gonna keep on breeding. And what they're gonna do is they're learning from my behavior. They're, they're not just breeding for the sake of breeding. They are learning from my behavior and they're getting better over time. There's a learning process happening here. But it's not gradient-based optimization, which is what we're used to. And it's not reinforcement learning based, which I talked about last week with the DeepQ Learner. This is a whole different paradigm. It's called genetic algorithms. And sometimes it's called evolutionary algorithms as well. But now there's, there's, a, there's a million of them. Anyway, so that's what the game is gonna look like. This is in the browser. We can also compile it from our desktop. But that's the basic idea. Oh my God, there's so many of them. They are breeding like invaders. Okay, so. That's what we're going to do. And so what our algorithm does, very simple, it's a very simple algorithm, but the concept itself is very cool. Uh, is it starts off with four invaders. So the game doesn't can never have less than four invaders. Four is the minimum. So there's no there's no winning the game. Just, you know, whatever. But you can't have more than 100 invaders. So the, the interval is between four and 100. If there are 100 invaders on the screen, we lose. It's game over. But if there, we try to keep them as close to four as possible by shooting them. And so each invader has four what are called genes. You can think of them as attributes as well. Speed, how fast it's moving, the probability that it's gonna change direction, which is between zero and one, as all probabilities are. The size of the invader, it could be big, it could be small, they're variational, there's all sorts of sizes. And the color, which is kind of negligible, really, but uh, we'll, we'll update that as well, it's a hex value. And so it has four attributes or genes as we call them in this paradigm. And every five seconds they mate or cross over. And it produces children, like new invaders, that are supposed to be better than, than, its parent, than their parents. And the invaders with the highest fitness by some measure of fitness that we define, we're gonna define what fitness means. It's like a you know, arm measuring contest. And by some measure of fitness, we're going to determine who gets to breed and who doesn't. It's a very Darwinian process. So that's what it is. And the invaders that learn the best or, or, or who have the best set of genes are gonna be the ones who get to cross over or breed. So this is a this is this image all of genetic algorithms all of genetic algorithms can be summed up in this image but before i get to this image let me look down here a little bit and give a little bit of background because i never talk about biology but it's dope so let me talk about it so dna we all know what dna is right it's the blueprint of life all all humans share 99.9% of the same dna it's that 0.1% difference that results in are the way we are different that results in Charlottesville and oh anyway to you know I gotta stay relevant here you know trending terms anyway uh, but DNA is the, the blueprint of life from DNA springs everything else and so genes are the recipes so you can think of DNA as the cookbook it's the book of all the recipes and the recipes are the genes right you have a gene for your uh, hair color you have a gene for your eye color your gene for everything right and so DNA consists of genes and from these genes that make up the DNA strand come proteins and proteins make up the physical attributes that make up who you are so uh Right, so that's, D that's DNA and those are genes. And so we could think of these genes as parameters for each individual. So each individual is like, has a set of genes or parameters that adapt over time based on how they breed. 
And so all life on Earth has sprung up this way through Darwinian natural selection. The idea is that usually species will overpopulate, It'll, they'll create more than necessary to survive, and then there's gonna be variation amongst all the individuals of the species. This, this guy's skin color will be brown, this guy's skin color will be white, this guy's skin color will be black, all sorts of different people. And then what happens is selection. So everybody's gonna to try to reproduce. I mean, that's the point of life if you think about it at the, at the low level or at the basic level. I mean, there, there are other points of life. Like, you, it doesn't just have to be about sex. It's, it could be about social impact. You make your own meaning in the end, but I digress. Anyways, everybody tries to breed, but the ones that, uh, whose children are the most fit are the ones who get to survive or the ones who are most likely to survive. And the way that nature does this is it lets, it, it, it finds those that are most fit by some measure of fitness, in the real world it would be brute physical strength. And it, those genes are then more likely to be passed on to next, the next generations. And so that's adaption. So that's like the idea behind which, and now I'll go back to this, genetic algorithms are based off of. So we initialize, so the first step is initialization, so we'll create a population, whether that's space invaders, whether that's different solution, possible solutions to some uh, train route optimization problem, like different routes, and then those routes evolve. But anyway, we initialize some population of, of, of solutions, possible solutions, and then we assign each of those uh, individuals a fitness value by some fitness function that we decide. What, and it's, it's very problem specific as well. Like based on the problem, what is the, how fit is this individual? or solution, you, you can call it as well. And then we select those uh, individuals that are the fittest, and then by some measure of you know, what uh, that fitness is. In the easy case, we can just think about it, fitness as outputting just a single scalar value, right, for each person, and then we just choose those um, individuals that have the highest fitness level and that highest fitness level could be you know it has to be greater than 10 or else they don't get to breed and then we choose all those that's a selection process and then there's crossover or mating or sex if you want you know whatever it is and uh, right so they reproduce these genes <laughs> why am I laughing because I said sex I know Oh my God, my, uh. so these genes reproduce. That's the whole point, right? That's how you came out, that's how I came out. Oh, okay, so then they cross over, and then the fittest ones, those are the children. We then, the last step is mutation. We take those children and we add some, we add some kind of mutation to them. So we can multiply them by some random distribution like a Gaussian or you know whatever else. And that's, that's how that works. So let me go back to this. Okay, so then we mutate them. And so what, the reason we mutate them is so there, there is some variation, right? It, not, it doesn't necessarily mean that the genes that are passed on are the optimal gene values. Like they could be better, but we know that they are the best of the type of genes that we've been given. So we could take those best of what we've been given and if we mutate them, we open up the possibilities of there being better genes out there that weren't even from the parents, right? Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why we vary them a little bit. We, we add some kind of variational probabilistic aspect. I'm doing this because I'm talking, I'm, I'm thinking about distributions, right? And uh, also, in terms of crossover, uh, there are different ways of crossing over parents. You could add these two scalar values together, you could multiply them, you could multiply, divide by two, and then square it. You know, it depends on what you define by crossing over. And once we meet some stopping criteria, uh, then we, we, we end the game. Like let's say you know, we want the solution to be X amount, so we'll measure how good it is. And so in our case, it's gonna be having 100 invaders. That's the stopping criteria. But if we haven't met it, then we just repeat this process over and over and over again. All right, so that's that. And uh, now we're gonna talk about the use cases. So, okay, so most of the advances in machine learning have been due to gradient-based optimization. As long as we can compute some gradient value, we can compute how best to update the weights of our network, the parameters of our network, right? Whether that's through supervised or unsupervised learning, clustering, uh, classification, generation, you know, variational autoencoding, all of these things are based off of having a gradient value that we can then update our, our weights with. But in this case, there's no gradient value. This is a totally different paradigm. There's no linear algebra and there's no calculus involved. There is just algebra, 
like performing the crossover and then performing the mutation. It's like multiplication, addition, subtraction, basic operations, and then probability. And the probability is the mutation as well. Like, you know, it's, there's a probabilistic aspect to who gets to reproduce and what those mutations look like. So there's only probability in algebra, whereas in gradient-based optimization, where most of the advances in machine learning have occurred, there's calculus and linear algebra and probability theory and statistics. So it's an easier way of thinking about it, and it's not necessarily as uh, it's not necessarily as efficient when it comes to certain use cases. But these genetic algorithms are used in real-world applications. One of them, one example, is for relational databases like Postgre or H2. They select the best query plan by the which is the one with the lowest estimated cost. They're used in finance a lot for stock price prediction. Uh, for portfolio optimization, evolving design. So computer-aided design is a great example where you have some idea of what the solution should be. You don't know exactly what it is, but you have some kind of base design, whether that be a CAD model, like a 3D CAD model, or a set of, of rules to conduct some kind of experiment. And you can evolve these rules over time uh, so that they get better and better. And so this is used in evolving CAD models in engineering, wind turbines and things like that, things that you would design, which is a really cool field. And it's very closely related to generative, generative modeling uh, from gradient-based optimization, like generative adversarial networks and variational autoencoders where you generate new data. It's kind of similar to that. It's in the same kind of subfield, computer-aided design. So those are two use cases, although, right, you don't, you don't see these, you don't see like the top researchers at DeepMind or OpenAI or, you know, anywhere posting uh, papers on genetic algorithms. It just doesn't happen. Uh, but I still believe in them. I still believe in them. And when to use this, if you have a huge search space and you're not really sure what the ideal solution should be, like computer-aided design, it's a very creative, open-ended solution, then that would be a, a good, um, uh, this would be a good solution to that problem. And so whenever you have a multi-dimensional search space, it's just a huge search space and you don't even know what the deal is. Okay, so that's the high level of what genetic algorithms are. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go over the code for this game. It's very doable and it's all gonna be in Python. The only parts that I'm gonna code are the three main parts. And the three main parts are uh, selection, crossover, and mutation. So those are the parts I'm gonna code. The rest of it, we're gonna go uh, and just glaze over it and I'm gonna talk about what's happening there. So there are four different classes here. There are four different classes and we're going to start at the highest level class, which is just this right here, this 30 lines of code, the main code, and then we're going to iteratively go down the hierarchy of functions till we get to the lowest level, which is evolution, where that, that is where the real evolutionary code is happening and that's where I'm going to code some parts, all right? So let's start at the high level. So we have four dependencies here that we're going to import. Let me make this really big for us so we can really see what's going on here. All right, make it bigger. Bigger is better, as they say in, as I say. Okay, so four, four dependencies. SGE is a wrapper around Pygame. Now, Pygame is the, the most popular game building library in Python, and SGE, you pronounce it Sage, is a wrapper over Pygame, which makes it even easier to use. However, like with all wrappers, because there is a layer of abstraction, the trade-off is you don't get as much control over the details. Uh, but we're not gonna talk about you know, the details. We, we're, we're building a very simple game. And so SGG, SGE is essentially Pygame, but wrapped to a higher level. Game is our object that's going to contain the game logic. Objects are are the player and the invader class that we'll define as well. And OS is just for you know, operating system functionality. Right? So in our main function, here's the highest level of the code. So first we're gonna define where the file is, and then we'll create the game object. So when we, when we initialize invader's game, that's just gonna set some basic parameters like the clock time, uh, whether or not there's a game over, which there's not gonna be when we start off, duh and some other things, but these are just game-specific parameters, not player or invader-specific parameters. Those are objects, all right? So then we'll initialize the game, 
And then we're gonna load up the background. And by the background, I mean the color of the, the back of the game, right? Let me just show it over here. So the color of the back of the game, I'll, I'll keep going back to this, by the way, right? So we want a black screen, and so that's what we're doing here. We're defining a black screen, we have a wall height, and we have a resolution, and we call it wall sprite. A sprite is like a, a figure, right, an animation, but the, we're just gonna call the background a wall sprite as well. And we'll set it as a background layer, and we only ha have one layer, so it's just setting the background layer to that wall sprite as a rectangle that we draw. Once we have that, we'll add it to the background. So we take our background layer that we've initialized and add it to the background. And so that now we have a black box for a game so far. And now we have a background, now we'll initialize our objects. We have a set of invaders, so we'll start off with six of them. So we say, let's, let's create, let's initialize an invader six times, and we'll store them all in this invaders uh, array or list. And then we have our player, which is just one, that's us. And then we say the player is always the first object. So we take both of them and we add them to this object array with the player being first. So it's in, we're initialized before the invaders are. And then we start the game. Well, we don't start the game, we initialize a session of the game. And so this is kind of like the Pi game specific syntax of like, you know, syntactic sugar. It's like in TensorFlow where you initialize a session and then you run the computation graph. So we initialize a session here with the game room function, giving it the background that we defined and the objects, our player and the invaders. And then we remove the mouse because we don't wanna see any of that. We, we're focused on our invaders and our player. That's it, right? And then here we go, we start the game. We, we initialize a session and then we start the game. And that's it at a high level, right? Very easy stuff, no, no evolutionary anything, no anything really. Too easy almost, right? I know it's too easy for you. You, you smart, you smart person, you. All right, so, all right, anyway, where were we? Uh, right, so now we're going down a level of hierarchy. We're going down one. We're going to objects. So for objects, we define our invaders, right? So we, we define our game and, and we define our classes. So now let's define those objects, those those entities inside of the game. So our first entity is gonna be our invader. Now our invader is the one that is the individual that will breed and cross over, you know, all this, you know, mutation. All of this evolutionary logic will be applied to this invader. So let's 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 define what this invader uh, what the attributes are. So our first step is going to be to define the genes, the genes for the invader. So when I say attributes, this is what I mean. The first one is gonna be size, and so these are key value pairs stored in a dictionary, okay? These are key value pairs. So for each of these genes, we are going to store a minimum value and a maximum value, and we're gonna have some generated uh, random number here. So we're gonna be able to say, let's generate a value for this uh, individual, for this gene, and it's gotta be between the min and the max. And if it's smaller than the min or it's greater than the max, then we're just return the min or the max respectively. But you can't generate a value for this gene for any individual that's beyond the scope of this min and max value, right? So we'll do that for the size of them, right? So it's, the size has to be between one and seven. The color, right, we have colors on a scale of zero to 255, but our min is gonna be five. Our speed between 0.01 and five, our y velocity, or, or x and y velocity, are speeds in you know both directions, both axes, and then our probability of changing directions in both the x direction, x direction, and the y direction, up and down, up and down, up and down. Wavy hair. I got my hair dyed silver again. Yes. Oh my God. It was so long. I'm so happy to have the silver again. Back to this. Back to this. Back to this. Okay, so we have those genes, and now let's look at this next function, which is to generate some genes for an invader. So whenever we initialize an invader, this generate gene function is called right here as a set of attributes when we initialize it. So let's look at what this code looks like. We're gonna use that generated number like we define over here to define uh, what this is gonna be like, right? A value for this specific gene. So we know what the max value is and what the min value is. And if the generated number is less than the min, return the min. If it's greater than the max, return the max, else return the generated number. And so that's how, we, that's how we generate genes for each individual in this function, right? So when we, when, we, when we initialize an invader, like we did over here, we said, let's initialize six of them. When we initialize an invader, this is the logic that's being called, right? So first of all, we'll generate some random values for its genes and store them in the attributes. And then we'll set the generated genes for this invader in terms of genes. That's just, you know, genes are the attributes, same thing. And then we'll set its sprite uh, animation, which is that like uh, 
now robot looking dude that was, what was it, this, this thing, right? It's not game over. The game isn't over till I say it's over or till we say it's over. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, press enter. Ready, steady, goey. Come on, come on, Gene. There we go. Such a fun game, right? So it's this little sprite animation, this like little character thing here, and, and it's just a it's just a PNG. It's just an image, a static image that we're setting here using the the beauty of SGE that just lets us you know magically set these uh, sprites for an object that we declare. And then we're gonna pull these values from the genes. So we have these generated values and they're all stored in this genes list, but we'll also have individual uh, variables for each of these gene values, just because it's easier to call later, to get, to pull later on. And we'll set the width for the image and the, and the height, the scale, and it's gonna start off with zero in terms of its fitness score. We don't know how fit it is yet because it was just initialized. So we'll initialize that value as zero. Zero to hero, Hercules. That, I was just saying that. I try to keep it interesting. Anyway, uh, right, so we have those values and now, okay, so here's, here's, here's something really cool. So notice this function right here, event step. You're like, okay, event step, great. What this, what this does is it, uh, in one, so there are events, right? So every step or time step in the game, there's a series of time step, you know, every interval, like da, 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 da. there's always time steps in machine learning. And so at every time step, do something, right? So what is that thing that, uh, this invader is going to do? What it's going to do is it's going to increase its fitness score by one because the longer it's alive, the more fit it is. That's what we're saying. That's what our fitness score is. There's more to the fitness score um, that I'll talk about in a second, but that's kind of the basic idea. But because this, 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 this invader has survived a single time step, we're gonna increase that fitness score by one. And so then we change directions randomly. So we'll, so we'll, we'll initialize some random value and say if it's less than the probability of changing directions, then change the direction. Else, you know, for, for both X and Y. Then we have logic for bouncing off the edges and the wall, all four sides, up, down, left, and right. Okay, so that's all it does. It, it computes movement, like where should this invader move in this time step? And so that's how the invader is just moving, randomly all over the place. But it's not just moving randomly, it's moving randomly, but based on the genes, like what these values of these genes are. So you see how its movement is dependent on the genes, right? One gene would be the X probability, one gene would be the Y probability, the x velocity, the y velocity, okay? So, okay, so here's the interesting thing. So you're looking at this and you're like, okay, so this happens at every time step. When is this function called? So you'll look at this, you'll copy it, you'll control F, you'll try to find where it's, where it's called. Well, this is, just a, this is just a duplicate of it. This, it's not called there. This is another duplicate. Where is this thing called? So the thing is, it's not called anywhere. There are event listeners. So that's that's another thing about uh, SGE or Sage with Pygame. You have event listeners because if we were to call this, we would just have like a while loop, right? Because we'd have to call it continuously throughout the whole game. But we're not gonna do that. Why should we do that? Uh, we're just gonna have these event listeners and they're built into SGE. So what I'm saying is these functions are going to fire every time there is a new time step by themselves, kind of auto-magically. It's built into the framework. It's kind of like iOS or Android programming if you've ever done mobile development. You don't wanna just, you're not, you're not manually constructing event listeners for all the actions that a user can do. Swipe up, swipe down, tap, you know, two fingers, three fingers. You have those event listeners uh, that are a part of the core framework that are gonna fire whenever a user does that action. So user swipes up would, would fire. So if you, were to, if you were to put a breakpoint inside of that function and the user swipes up, the breakpoint would catch that action. And then you could execute whatever code you want to. And it's very useful for mobile development. And it's also very useful for game development, having event listeners built into the framework so we don't have to build them. So we can just say event step is gonna be this. And the reason we can say this is because this class inherits from the SGE uh, DSP object class. We're overriding these functions, right? So that's, that's it for our invader, right? That, that's the basic logic of, of us defining what those genes are and then logic for moving and for generating, uh, generating those values for each gene. Okay, so in a single time step. Now let's define it for the player, right? So when we initialize a player, we are going to say, okay, there, we, there, we can only move in two directions, left or right, that's it. So we'll define maps for both of those keys. And then we're gonna say, okay, what's the starting position? What's the sprite image, 
right? And that's it for our initialization steps. And then we can go to our event step. And remember, this is called every time step of the game. So we'll say, okay, first of all, let's capture the direction entered by the player, whether it's left or right, and we'll put that in the key motion variable. We'll find the speed in the X direction, and then we'll animate the sprite according to the moving direction, right? So if we're going left, then move the image this way. If we're going right, move the image this way. That's it. And then we keep a paddle inside of the window, right? So then we're never outside of the bounding box on both sides. We want to keep the player inside of that bounding box. And so whenever the player shoots, right, whenever the player shoots, we're going to say, you know, whenever the space button is pressed, the number of invaders must be higher than the minimum allowed and the number of bullets lower than the maximum. And only if, if that's the case can the player fire a bullet. So these are uh, parameters for which, for when we can fire a bullet or not, which means we have one more class and that class is the bullet itself. So like that little bullet that's traveling when the, when the player shoots. So we'll animate that using this sprite function. It's, that, it's a little, you know, fiery little image. We'll set that. We'll set its speed, which is gonna be the starting speed that we define as a beforehand. And then we'll say in the event step, which is happening at every iteration, either destroy it, or if there's a collision, then uh, kill that invader, whoever it touches. All right, so that's for our objects class. And now we have our game class. And so in our game class, we'll say, okay, we've got our game engine, we've got our, uh, player and invader objects, evolution, which I'll code in a second, our time, and then our clock. So then we have a bunch of uh, global parameters here for the resolution, for the position of the objects, for how, uh, how the number of milliseconds between generations, like 5,000 milliseconds or five seconds, and the minimum generation time, as well as like what's the, what's the lower limit that we want it to be, the number of invaders, four, and the max, 100. Minimum, four, max, 100. So in a game class, which we initialized right here, what happens here? Well, like I said, we, we are initializing a bunch of these game-specific parameters, the HUD, which is the score and the timer, whether or not it's game over, very basic stuff, the clock, and then we have some basic code for the HUD, uh, which is not, you know, I, I won't go over that. And then uh, a new generation. Okay, this, this part's interesting. So, so we'll generate some new invaders, and then we'll reduce the time between generations, which makes it harder for the player, right? So that's why we had this minimum value for the generations 2000, because the time for generation between generations will decrease every time step. So it gets harder and harder. And then in an event step for one full game, we'll first calculate the number of invaders on the screen, show the score, and if it's more than our threshold, it's game over. We're done, we're through. Our, our, the jig is up, uh, the gig is up. But if, if it's over our threshold, then it's time to breed again. So we'll create a new generation, right? And so, but if it's four, if, it, if, it's, if, if, if there's four invaders on the screen and we're trying to kill one of them, we can't do that. So we'll draw this immunity bubble around them, which means like you just can't kill them until more are generated. So that's kind of our way of saying that this is the minimum number of invaders. We'll have key presses for you know, escaping and for, for pausing the game. Um, and so, okay, so this is, this is an interesting step. This is where the animation for how crossover is happening happens, right here. So whenever, so every five seconds the game pauses and then those invaders will, will breed. And then, uh, so what's happening is we'll say recombinate, which is the crossover step to create those ch child, child genes and add the new individuals to our current list and then reanimate. Okay, and so then for key pressing and for event closing. All right, so now let's get to our good stuff, the real, the real, the real meat of this code. So before I get to these three things, let, let me talk about the bounding interval for the genes. So we always have some bounding interval, like it's got to be between this this scalar value and this scalar value. So this is where the crossover and the mutation is happening, and this is where the selection is happening. So those are the three really key aspects. Of, of how this works. We'll, we'll create a list for the offspring that we'll store the values in for all the, for all the children. And so for each pair of parents, right, we're giving it parents as the parameters here. We're gonna say, okay, so for each pair of parents, let's go ahead and uh, create an empty store for the offspring's genes. So we'll say, okay, so the, for the genes of each child, for these, this pair of parents, for each gene from the key value pairs, remember it's a dictionary that these gene values are stored in, we're gonna store both pairs as gene attributes. Okay, so for both parents, we're gonna compute what those genes are that we want to give to our children as values and we're gonna randomly generate the, ch the child genes attributes. So for the children, the, for, the, 
for each child genes, and this gen is gonna be the index for the specific child, we'll use a uniform distribution to compute what the values should be. So we'll say, okay, min values and then max values. So it's gonna be a distribution between the min and max values for this gene. And then we'll randomly decide if it's time to mutate the children. So if, if it's, so we'll generate some random number and then if it's less than the mutation probability, then we'll go ahead and mutate the children, else we won't. So this is, this is how we select uh, whether or not we're gonna mutate the children or not, so, right? So, and our mutation probability is 0.1. So it's gotta be less than that. So we'll say, okay, so first get the min and the max values for the parent. So the min and the max values for the parent. And we'll say gen min. And then we have for the, the max value for the parent, and we'll say gene props gen max, all right? And then we'll get the value for the child, and the child is going to be that same index. And now it's time to mutate. So for mutation, here's what it looks like for mutation. So, so basically for this mutation step, we're introducing new genetic material into the population by replacing one parameter in the genome by this random value within the allowed range. And then once we have that, then we can go ahead and return, we can go ahead and add the children to the store. So offspring.append and then the children gene. And then finally we'll return all of the children. Return offspring. And this goes right here. Okay, great. Right, so that's for our crossover and mutation. That's how we're crossing over parents. Uh, we're saying, we're taking these values from both parents and using those values for those genes to help compute this child gene. And then we're mutating the child gene, right? Using this uh, random normal distribution. So that's crossover and mutation, and then there's selection. So of these children, who gets to reproduce? So for all the members of the population, we'll sum up all of their fitness scores, and then we'll say, okay, so we'll randomly generate a distribution, and then for each invader, we'll subtract its value, its fitness value, from the randomly generated number. And if it's less than zero, then that invader gets to breed. So here's, here's why we're doing this. So you might be thinking, okay, so why couldn't we just compute the fitness for each individual, and then say, whichever, you know, however long it's alive, we'll just keep incrementing that fitness value, that scalar single value. And then the ones that have the highest fitness scalar, why don't we just choose those? Why do we have to add this random value? The reason we're adding a random value here is because um, the ones with the best genes in the immediate term doesn't necessarily mean it has the best genes in the long term. So if we add some kind of variational or probabilistic aspect to it, then that allows for um, different possibilities, right? It means that these genes right now were the best ones, but let's add some variation to it just in case there's other possibilities out there. Do you see what I'm saying? So by adding a variational aspect to selection, it's it just improves how we evaluate the fitness for each individual. And so that's that's it really for this. And then we have this mating pool and tournament, but that's just for that's just for printing out the terminal. So that's it for this code. Uh, if you liked it, please check out the GitHub repository. I've got all the instructions and the details in there, definitely try out a genetic algorithm on your own. They're very simple, very easy to understand. You don't need to know backpropagation or calculus or linear algebra. Very simple stuff. You can easily implement them in Pygame, in OpenAI's gym, in OpenAI's universe. There's a bunch of possibilities. And if you do this, then it's just gonna increase your confidence as a developer, as a machine learning engineer, as a data scientist, whatever it is. So thank you for watching. I love you guys. Seriously, I do it for you. And if you made it this far, I'm very proud of you. Thank you. And I'll tell you a little secret. Something big is coming up. And only you get to know that because you made it to the end. I can't say what it is, but something big is coming up before the year ends for this channel. It's going to be amazing. All right, so that's it. Please subscribe for more programming videos. And for now, I've got to evolve my hair. So thanks for watching.